I've learned many lessons in this watch hobby, like mechanical watches are CTs of gears and art on your wrist, uh, quartz watches are more affordable and more accurate than mechanical watches, Rolex is the king, Omega is the rock star, Invicta is the American Idol audition reject, many things I've learned in this hobby. But speaking of G-Shock, I was surprised to learn the G-Shock is actually turning into Rolex in the most alarming way possible. Well, Rolex is quality, of course, many of us know that. Rolex is quality the Swiss way and G-Shock is uh, excellence the Japanese way. But little did I know that both are now picking the people who should own them. Find out how G-Shock is doing it the Rolex way. For someone to get a Rolex today, a buyer needs to break through a number of barriers. There's the price barrier, the availability wall, and then the customer classification. By logic, this is meant to select only the most qualified of customers and drive away the rest of the people. This, among other things, actually contributes to the desirability of Rolex as a brand. Many are already familiar with this from the king of watches, but did you know? That this is also happening with the toughest watch in the planet? Recently, the new 30th anniversary Frogman was sold using a lottery scheme to choose its lucky owner. Casio members had to apply online to have their names registered on the database. Casio then picked the allocations for that country. With the considerably expensive price of this 30th anniversary Frogman and the lottery picking process, these barriers clearly prevented a lot of fans from getting one of these unique pieces. As a casual fan of watches, you may find this absurd. As a watch collector, you are familiar with this kind of product distribution. Just replace G-Shock with a brand that starts with the letter R. Of course, Rolex has not employed a lottery scheme to randomly pick a prospective buyer. The closest thing to this is that Rolex sends allocations to authorized dealers based on the units they move. So, a Terno store, for example, that sells hundreds of units a month would get more and better watches from Rolex compared to a small boutique in an island like Aruba that moves only a handful at the same time. In both G-Shock and Rolex case, the whole point of limiting access to these sought-after pieces is to reward the most loyal and avid fans. This creates levels of desirability in the minds of audiences. In Rolex case, their marketing presence created a perception of status. A customer feels satisfaction by simply owning one of the most coveted watches in the world. And that's true down to the lowest tier of Rolexes. From there, you can just go up to more challenging pieces to own, if you're a loyal customer that is. G-Shock, however, employs the brand reputation as a gateway into ownership. Owning a G-Shock means that you appreciate Japanese ingenuity and various cultures. This brand, however, conditions you through the accessibility and vast range of its offerings. So when you discover that there are more luxurious models, you are either happy to stay loyal to your chosen range or you aspire to get to the next tier up. But let's say that you want to stay in the lower range of G-Shocks. You can still actually experience the rush of picking up a special or limited piece. The John Mayer Houdinki collaborations would come to mind or the Bamford releases. These are small batches that people can scramble to buy, often selling out in mere minutes. Swatch also broke through the public consciousness with its collaboration with Omega in the Moon Swatch. The difference with G-Shock is that you don't feel the same brand loyalty with Swatch. With G-Shock, the special and limited editions adds to the culture of variety. There's one for every taste. So while the brand blocks certain tastes out, it caters to some preferences. All you have to understand is that G-Shock releases collections frequently, so frequently in fact that it's hard to keep up. Along with this selection process is the disappointment. It's natural for a person who's denied access to something that they like to feel left out or let down. With Rolex luxury pricing and prestige, the disappointment is equally and understandably high. But with G-Shock, the disappointment is there, but since the barrier of entry to other limited models is low, fans can hop right back into the hunt very easily. 
there is an actual psychological behavior that G-Shock is tapping onto. Frederick Bakeland published an article in 1981, The Psychological Aspects of Art Collecting, where he distinguished the accumulator from a collector. The main difference between the two is that an accumulator is a person who indiscriminately accumulates things and often feels a measure of shame for what he is accumulating. A collector, on the other hand, finds satisfaction on things of interest and is often willing to exhibit their collection. G-Shock encourages people to collect certain models and styles. You see this with their marketing as it aims for their target demographic. Their pricing range also shows that they want to reach the widest audience as possible. By creating a culture behind the collecting of these watches, the desirability of G-Shock continues to rise. The more a fan is loyal to G-Shock, the more the brand rewards them with more styles and models to choose from. Yes, G-Shock may be turning into Rolex for the higher-end pieces by making it harder to get. But unlike Rolex, if you fail to get your piece, G-Shock has a lot of fallback options for the loyal fans to choose from. By this brand objective, G-Shock is able to attain what Rolex achieved with luxury watches. G-Shock is now the quintessential king of tough, yet collectible, quartz watches. When you're able to build up a fan base through the years, it's not a bad thing to cater to your most loyal fans. It's just a little bit awkward to know or to find out that this is happening with one of the most accessible brands in the planet. But G-Shock knows what it's doing because it's part of their blueprint for brand loyalty.